to do you. Come on in the room. Would you come in, please share it? We're about to have our online Bible study. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Share it as we come in. Bless the name of the Lord. Yes, to you. Yes, to you. Come on in the room. We're about to have our uh, Bible study on tonight. One hour of power Bible study and prayer. And uh, when you come in the room, please share it. Do me a favor and share it for me. Um, we're going to talk about what's happening right now. And uh, looking forward to uh, sharing this with everyone. Uh, we have a lot going on in the city. And I trust and pray for you that um, we're home today, that you're fine, that you're well. You that have to go actually go out and work in the elements like me. Uh, we understand that for those that are in the New York area, New York City area, the tri-state area, uh, that um, we are contemplating, the mayor is contemplating, uh, the mayor and the governor, that is uh, what is called a, a, uh, a lockdown, a shelter place order, which basically means um, a lockdown for like 48 hours. They usually do that in the time of war, so it really shows the significance of what we're in right now. But as you're tuning in, um, share the video. I'm going to get right into it. Um, going to pray today, and we're going to really invite the people of God uh, to um, the Word today, and we're going to pray. Uh, and I want you to be encouraged. I want you be, to be encouraged. I've been uh, sharing with my congregation um, the soldier psalm, uh, psalm of spiritual warfare. That is Psalms 91. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about even some of the things that I preached about on Sunday. Uh, and the title of the message actually uh, last week um, was uh, The Secret Place. I'm talking about The Secret Place and that's Psalms 91. But last week I talked about this past Sunday, I talked about the prayer that makes the difference. And there is a prayer that makes the difference. So uh, do your best to share. Uh, now I'm going to just focus on that. Just excited to be here. Bless you all uh, for tuning in. I appreciate you uh, for sharing it uh, in, um, in the comforts of your home or wherever you are. You're about to get blessed and we're about to really um, share the word of God. I'm excited about what God is doing. Uh, people are nervous and this is these are trying times, but I have peace. I Listen, church, God prepares us before things happen. And we've been talking about how to protect your peace. And isn't it interesting? We did, had no clue that there was going to be a breakout. And we've been studying for weeks on how to protect your peace. Isn't it a, a blessing? He foresaw, he foresaw uh, what, what was going to happen. Uh, so um, I've been talking and teaching about how to protect your peace. And in a time like this, where there's unrest, when people don't know there's uncertainty, we have never live through anything like this and what you need is the peace of God. We're going through a storm and I'm telling you that the coronavirus, the storm, the plague, um, the outbreak, um, people are nervous and they should be nervous, but God gives us a peace and peace is not um, something that is reflective of what's going on the outside, but the peace has everything to do with what's going on on the inside and you have to protect your peace. Um, Jesus was on, was in the stern on a boat in the middle of a storm, of a windstorm, the Bible says. 
And I want you to know that while he was in the windstorm, you know what he was doing? He was sleeping on a pillow. The Bible says Jesus was asleep on, in, on a pillow in the stern, in the middle of a windstorm. And the Bible says that waves were beating into the ship to the point where it was filling up with water. Everyone lost their peace. Everyone was had reason to. If they didn't lose their peace, um, something was wrong with them. They had reason to lose their peace. They lost it. They lost it. But what happened? Jesus uh, was, was still sleeping. He still didn't wake up. He was at peace. He was at peace. He was at his, his highest state of peace. When you're sleeping good, that means you're, you're getting some good peace. Uh, you're at a good state of peace and you're getting some good sleep. I need some peace. I need some sleep. Um, and the Bible says that uh, the disciples woke Jesus up and says, Master, Master, do you care that you that we're perishing? Um, Jesus walked up and I was talking about a positive attitude. He walked up and he rebuked the wind. Now, the word rebuke is a confrontational word. It's a confrontational statement. He got up, he rebuked the wind, then he turned around and rebuked the disciples. He rebuked the waves, the wind, and the disciples. The Bible says he rebuked the waves, he rebuked the wind, and he and, and the Bible, he says, peace be still, and immediately it stopped. The wind stopped, the waves stopped, and they were still. And then he says, you why did why are you so afraid? <laughs> why are you so fearful? And why 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 don't you believe? Um, how in the world do you believe that we're gonna die here with me? Jesus knew he wasn't dying. There was no cross on the boat. Jesus knew he wasn't dying. It wasn't his time yet. So why were they? He couldn't understand why his disciples were so fearful. And I can't understand. We can't understand why some of the saints are so fearful. I'm not saying not concerned. It would have been different if they woke him up and says, Master, Master, we got a little trouble. We got a little trouble on the boat. The boat is filling up with water. We got a storm. We need your help. They did not ask him for help. Understand the text. The disciples did not ask Jesus for help when they were in the windstorm. It was not raining. It said a windstorm. Okay, it wasn't a typical storm. It was a windstorm. You have to know what kind of storm you're in. You got to know what you're in. You can't just... Just fight any old fight. It was a specific kind of storm. What kind of storm? It was a wind storm. And, and where were they? They were on the water in a boat. So what was, was, was fluid? Uh, what the wind used what it had. It used the waves. And when you're in the wind storm, you got to know how the enemy will use whatever is surrounding. He will use your environment to come at you. Well, the elements of their environment wasn't stable. They were on, in the, on the sea. So the Bible says that the waves beat into the ship. And Jesus, when he got up, he knew who he was fighting. He knew what to speak to. My question to you, uh, brothers and sisters, do you know what you're fighting? Do you have the discerning of spirits to know uh, what you have to speak to? Jesus didn't speak to the cloud. He did not say, stop raining. No. The Bible says he spoke to the wind and the waves. And when he spoke, he rebuked the wind. He rebuked the waves and he says, peace, be still. The Bible says immediately they obeyed him. Now understand after he said that, he look, he's looking at, why were you so fearful? And why are you so doubting? Where's your faith? He was quite, he, he couldn't, he was baffled by their unbelief that you think that you're with me. I'm on your boat and you think something's going to happen to you. I'm telling you in the time like this, where they, listen, there is an upheaval. It's we're on shaky ground. The president, the governor, the mayor, the countries, we see people dying all across the world. This is not a joke, my friend. And I know it makes us feel better that if we don't think, oh, it's not that bad. No, it's bad. It's bad. But even, even if it's bad, it does not mean that we have to react to the storm. 
we should never react to the storm because when we react to the storm, we become fearful, we become doubtful, we become like everybody else. And if you are a believer of Christ, you are not like everybody else because if Christ is on the inside of you, there should be a peace that you should be able to go to sleep knowing that I can't die yet. My purpose is not yet fulfilled because Jesus is on the bo on board. I cannot react to what my surrounding is, although there's upheaval. I know what's going on right now. I'm fully aware what kind of storm I'm in, but I'm not going to react to it. I'm going to respond to it. So uh, it, it wasn't the fact that they came to Jesus in the middle of the storm. It's how they came to him. It's not the fact of, uh, that you come to me uh, and ask me for money. It's not the fact that you come, you come to me and ask me for help. It's how you come to me. They came to him. Do you care that we are perishing? Do you even care? Wake up. Do you look, you look at you want to sleep, sleep on a pillow. Do you even care? Get up. They woke him up in insolence. They woke him up in ridicule. They woke him up so that he could join their bandwagon and, and be frustrated. Because they doubted who was on board. My friends, I'm asking you, do you doubt who's on board? Do you doubt if you've given your life to Christ? Do you doubt that he's truly in charge of this? You've got to believe that although there is a windstorm. The Bible just said Jesus sent the windstorm. He was on, he was sleeping on, it wasn't him that sent it. Don't nobody tell me God sent the storm. Oh, you know, he was sleeping on the pillow. But when he woke up to the turmoil, he knew what to do with it. Please understand, when Jesus woke up to the storm, his disciples, they woke him up because they was like, do you care that we're perishing? He is not perishing. What are you talking about? It's not how, it's not that you go to God. It's how you go to God. If they would have came to, and said, Lord Jesus, we're perishing. We're in trouble. We need you. Help. Then he would have got up and he probably, he still would have rebuked the storm. He just wouldn't have rebuked them. I'm telling you today that God is going to take care of this catastrophe. The Lord is going to take care of the storm that we're in. Yes, there will be casualties. Yes, some people uh, will suffer from this storm. There will be uh, uh, some kind of ramifications from this storm. But God's people, you will be all right. Um, there's some things that we have to do to prepare for storms. If you don't, you will suffer greater damage. And we all know through technology, uh, through uh, uh, the, 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 the weather people and the folks that really study science, they have done a great job in forecasting storms and winds, hurricanes, earthquakes. What do we do? We prepare for the storm. Uh, and I'm telling you that this is the time that you have to prepare for what you're in. We are in a plague. We're in a plague. Guys, hello. My son does this annoying thing when I when, when I don't um, answer him right away. Hello, 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 hello. Like, do you realize that we're in a plague? We are in something. We're in something that's 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 devastating. It's a global crisis. So we, the church, we have an answer in this time of global crises. So I'm not afraid. Yeah, no, I'm not afraid. Am I concerned? Absolutely, but I'm not afraid. We're in the middle of a storm. We are in the middle of a global crisis. I know what this is. He says in the last days, there's going to be wars, rumors of wars. There's going to be people saying great deception, people saying I, that I came, that they're me. There's going to be a pestilence in the land, plagues. But he says, you know, none of these things are the ending. These, it's the beginning of the ending, but it's not the end. So do I believe the world is going to end and wipe us out with, the, with this coronavirus, COVID-19? No, the world is not going to end. Uh, and are, are some ramifications going to happen? Yeah, but the world is not going to end. I said the world is not going to end and you are not going to die. You don't have to die through this. Uh, some people will, but you don't have to. Some people will suffer loss, but you don't have to. And I'm going to talk, teach you some principles tonight of how to prepare and how to survive. No, not prepare, because sometimes it's too late to prepare. All right? You got to survive this storm. All right? You got to survive this storm. Um, and Psalms 91 is a psalm or a prayer of protection. Uh, it's a prayer of protection. Now, 
uh, some of you may be watching and you may know, well, I'm not religious. Well, all right, don't be religious, but I, I'm, I got a relationship with God and this prayer of protection protects me. It, it, it heals, it, it, it hedges me in and, and you need to uh, apply the principles of the word of God so that you will be hedged in and protected. Psalms 91 is that Psalm. Uh, I grew up on this Psalm and, and let me tell you, uh, the Psalm has blessed my life and has blessed so many people's lives. Uh, anybody that knows anything about the word of God knows that the word of God is our covering. Um, when God speaks something, that's one thing that we can depend on is God's word. But the Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will endure forever. So the psalm says simply like this in Psalms 91. Get it, get it out, get it. It's, it's the psalm of divine protection. It says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He who not visits, but he who dwells in the secret place shall abide, shall dwell, shall live under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the follower and from the noise and pestilence. He will cover you with his Feathers and under his wings shall you take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid for uh, the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the destruction that, 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 that wastes at noonday or the pestilence that walks in darkness. For a thousand shall fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but only with your eyes so you look and see the reward of the wicked. Uh, that's uh, uh, Psalms um, 91, verse 1 through 8. Now, let me just give you the understanding of this, that when you dwell in the secret place, what's the secret place? The secret place is, is that place of refuge and relationship with God. Now, he's not saying visit the secret place. He's saying if you dwell in a relationship, if you dwell in his presence, if you dwell in fellowship and in communion with him, you will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. A shadow is, is basically you're basking in the shade or the presence of something that is blocking of the sun. So the sun is directly the shadow, the image of whatever you're, you're under. The, the sun is hitting that image and you're only getting the shadow of it. So you're not having a direct contact. You have to go through the image before it gets to you. So when you're dwelling with a relationship with God, when the enemy comes, he has to go through God before he gets through you. So you have to live under the shadow. And if you do, you will abide there and you will know that he's your fortress and you just you, you, you know that he's your God and in him you'll trust. In him, you'll trust. You won't trust in people. You'll trust in God. And this is a time that we need to trust in God, not in man. No, don't get me wrong. I need men to come through. God uses men. He uses human beings. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. But, but, the, but this scripture, this Psalms 91, you got to say this. You got to speak this word over your life, over your family. It's a good prayer to pray. Uh, you don't have to be afraid for, for what's going on the outside because this word of God is going to cover you through this season. Uh, some of you can't wait for a vaccination to come out, but you need to vaccinate yourself spiritually with this word. It will protect you from the evil. Now, obviously, I'm going to tell you, of course, wash your hands. Yes, um, I'm, I follow all of the protocol that our medical science says, but some of this stuff is spiritual and you have to be able to protect yourself spiritually to be able to forge naturally and to be able to be over to overcome. He who dwells in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Are you dwelling in the secret place? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, he says, go, when you pray, go into your secret closet, shut the door, and pray to your Father in secret, and then he will reward you openly. Do you have a secret place with him? Are you dwelling in his presence? Are you praying? Are you believing God? Are you spending time in secret? Not where everybody can see you. People love to stand before people all the time and pray. 
Uh, people love to grab the microphone and pray. People love to allow other people to hear them pray. But there's a time that you should be praying in secret. And not, not only prayers of petition, because prayers of petition is, Lord, I need this, Lord, I need that, Lord, I ask you for this. But there's prayers of supplication and there's prayers of intercession, praying for those in government, praying for the land. The Bible says in uh, Chronicles uh, 7, 14, it says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive them of their sin. And I'll heal their land. So it's simple that when you begin to find that secret place. The principle of the word says. If my people which call by my name. If you humble yourself in your secret place. If you turn from your wicked ways. God will and pray and seek his face. He'll hear your prayers. What is he going to hear? Before he did any says anything. I will hear then heal. So what is God listening for? He's listening to hear who is going to pray. Who is going? He's listening to hear who's going to pray. You know why he's listening to hear who's going to pray? Because he, he's looking for your prayers to move. Now, some of you don't realize that God won't move without your prayers. There's many times God is sovereign. Yes, I understand that. But he has sovereignly chosen to work through us, human beings on the earth, to the point that uh, uh, your prayers, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this principle with, with, with you, your prayers can make the difference. See, this cliche that prayer changes things, people really don't know why prayer changes things. Oh, prayer changes, because if you pray, you know, uh, things happen. No, understand the principle. God limits himself through on earth to work through human beings. He limits himself. I'm going, I'm, going, I'm going to break it down to you in the scripture. But I'm going to give you the shortcut, a bridge version. He limits himself. Clearly, in when God made man, he made Adam, Isha and Isha, Adam and Eve. He made man, Adam. He placed them in the garden. He tells them to have dominion over the earth, rule over the earth. He puts them there in his stead. Understand Genesis 1. This is Bible study, so let me let's turn to it real quick. Let me just turn to it. Come on, come on, turn to it with me too, real quick. Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse uh, 26. Genesis 1, verse 26. It says this It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Uh, <clears throat> let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, um, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created uh, him in his, God created man in his own image, in the, the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Uh, so God created man in his image. Then he says, uh, he, I want you to rule and have dominion. That word rule doesn't mean that God said, I'm going to give you the earth and I no longer have the earth. No, I want you to have dominion over the earth. I want you to operate in the earth. So in Psalms, Psalms 8, Psalms 8, uh, verse 3, it says, When I consider your heavens, uh, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, uh, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? Uh, for you have made him a little lower than the angels. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your man, of your hands. And you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea uh, that pass through. So God puts man to rule as his representer on the earth. God didn't give away ownership of the earth, but he did assign him the responsibility to govern the earth. I want you to rule. We know what happened. We know that there was a fall in the garden. Now, when the fall, God gave man the keys. He gave him power, authority to rule and have dominion over the world. 
for you that is that's listening, you, you know, have you ever heard somebody say, well, why would a loving God allow people to be born with autism? Well, a loving God would allow plagues to be in the land. A loving God would allow people to be born blind. A loving God would allow people to be born deaf. Have you ever heard that? Well, uh, the reality is it's never God's. Everything that got created, it was all good. Uh, but the fall in the garden gave interest to sin. And we know what happened. Uh, Adam and Eve, uh, they, Eve uh, took of the fruit of the forbidden fruit of knowledge of good and evil. It wasn't an apple. I said it wasn't an apple. Some of y'all think it's an apple. We can eat apples. Apples is fine. Apples is nutritious. You know, it wasn't an apple. It wasn't a mango. It wasn't an orange. It was the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil that was forbidden. He says, you can eat every fruit of the garden. Just don't eat this one. God gave a commandment to them. They disobeyed. And what happens when we disobey? We allow the enemy to come in. Now, the, the, the authority or the power that God gave to Adam now was transferred to Satan. Understand this. You got to take this and understand what happened. So now sin into the world and everything that God made good is now twisted and perverted. And because it's now twisted and perverted, sin corrupts God's original intention. And this is the reason why Jesus had to come to redeem and restore us back to God's original idea for humanity. Uh, so uh, we are all under sin, everybody. Romans chapter 3, 23. We've all gone uh, out the way, all have sinned and come short to the glory of God. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. We know that. We understand that. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I know it seems elementary, but watch me build this house. Watch me build this house. Psalms 115, uh, 16. 115, 16 says that the heaven and even the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth he has given to the children of men. Psalms 115, 16. Come on, write it down. Psalms 115, 16. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth he has given to the children of men. Or the earth he's given to mankind. And so understand that God put man on the earth to rule the earth. All right? But man, because of the fall, who, who took the rulership of the earth? Satan understand that and the corruption came in the world and as a result of that now you have somebody that has power over the elements of the world and he has legal right and legal power uh, uh turn with me to luke luke chapter four luke chapter four that's gonna bless you this is gonna bless you luke chapter four verse six luke chapter four verse six turn with me please turn with me in your bible luke chapter four verse six it's gonna bless you it's gonna bless you I promise you this, this is going to bless you because the Bible says, then the devil taking him uh, up on the high mountain uh, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. This is Luke chapter four. Uh, here's verse five and six. Uh, now, in a moment of time, this is the temptation. Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights uh, and the devil tempted him. Uh, first, he, he said to command these stones to be turned bread. And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the father. Then he takes him up to a to a mountain right, and shows him all the kingdoms of the world in the moment of time. Obviously, this is supernatural. He didn't just take him to the mountain and say, see, he, he gives him a vision and shows him all the kingdoms of the world, not just where he was geographically in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this power or authority is the proper translation. I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I will give it to whomever I wish. Understand what Satan says to Jesus. It has been given to him. Who gave it to him? Who gave it to him? It was given to him. Well, who had it in the first place? Who had this power over the earth? Or the king? God gave it to Adam. Right? God gave it to Adam. So now Satan said, it's been given to me and I can give it to whoever I want to give it to. All right. So he's offering Jesus the power that he took from Adam when they fell in the garden. The devil will always try to negotiate with you and give you something for less than what is worth. Never sell out. And accept his offer because God always can do better. God can always counter offer what the devil is offering you. 
Please understand the devil offered him the kingdoms of the world and the authority that Adam had. He, he, listen, I can give it to you. Jesus says, uh, he was very clear that Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. He defeated him with the word of God. Uh, he knew that he wasn't coming to, to, to get that power back. No, he was coming. When God restores you, he never gives you back what you had. He always gives you better. He always gives you better. So don't you even think that when you are going to get restored to your job or restored in your relationship or restored in your marriage, that you're going to get what you had had lost. No, he's going to give it to you with interest. The Bible says with the thief be found, he shall restore, return sevenfold. So Jesus didn't settle. He wasn't going to worship Satan for, for what he get with Adam. What? what? No. Uh, so um, Jesus even called Satan the ruler of the world. Uh, please turn with me to, 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 to John chapter 12, verse 31. John 12, 31. Come on. John 12, 31. John 12, 31. And, and, and please, when, when, you, when you get to this scripture, it's going to blow your mind. Because you have to know who's in charge of the world. Oh, why all this stuff is happening in the world? Uh, no, it's not God's fault. There's a devil loose. Understand, there's a devil loose. Stop blaming all the, all the catastrophes on God. On the natural disasters on God. Yes, he's ultimately in control, but God plays by the rules. God plays by the rules. All right? God made the rules. Uh, here in verse 31 of chapter 12, it says, now, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Who's the prince of this world? Uh, the uh, a New King James Version says, the ruler of this world. Shall be Who's the ruler of this world? John 12, 30. Who is the ruler of this world? You would think, is it man? He, no, he didn't say man. Man was the ruler of this world. In, in Genesis, he said he made him ruler over the world. But now in, in John 12, 31, we understand who's the ruler now. Who's the ruler? Satan. Isn't that crazy? Jesus says the ruler of this world is going to get cast out. So in Genesis, man is the ruler of the world. But in John chapter 12, Satan is the ruler of the world. Understand what happened. So in, in, between Genesis chapter two, two, 1, uh, and obviously we know what happened in Genesis chapter 3. Now in John chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus is saying that Satan is the ruler of this world, or the prince of the, of the, of the world. Now, Paul says it this way, talks about the sons of, uh, the, 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 you know, the children that, that um, the sons of that walks under the power of the prince of the air. All right. The prince of the air, the ruler of the world. Ephesians, you know, is rulers of darkness, rulers of the world. So Satan, in a sense, uh, uh, has uh, rule authority over the world. But Jesus came to take that authority back. He came to take it back. So um, you, you got to understand. So now here is where I really want to get to. Now that we built the foundation in the house, I got to get to it now. Uh, uh, so here's the reason why it's important that you pray because God limited himself to human beings to be able to either lose it or regain it. Right? So this is the reason why God chose from the time of his creation to work on earth through human beings, not independent of them. He always needs somebody to work through. If I was preaching to a congregation, I'll say, look at a neighbor and tell the neighbor, God needs you. Well, I'll just tell you, God needs you. God needs you to work through. He doesn't, he does, he's not going to work through a cloud or work uh, as a spirit and come down and show you in the, no, he works through people. That's why if you want to show the love of God, you got to love people. Uh, so I'm going to tell you the importance of prayer. Uh, uh, he always wills to do something uh, and he always wills to work through people, uh, even at the cost of becoming one. He had to became, become a human being in order to redeem us, right? So he, God sovereignly works through people. And though God is sovereign and all-powerful, Scripture teaches us that he limits himself, uh, uh, according to the affairs of the earth, to work through us. Now, this is very important because uh, it, it, this is the reason why the, the world is where it is. Because sometimes we don't do our job. We are supposed to pray. That his kingdom comes. And Matthew chapter 6, uh, there is a model prayer. 
and he's telling us what he wants us to do. He's saying, God says, pray that his kingdom come, his will be done. You know the prayer, our father who art in heaven. He says, when you pray, pray our father who art in heaven, how will it be thy name? Pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Who's on earth? You and I. Who's on earth? You and I. Pray while we're on earth, God's will. And if we pray on earth, he'll do it in heaven. Heaven is not just a place of paradise. Heaven is where warfare takes place. Believe it or not, the devil is not beneath you in the earth, right? He's in the, he's in a heaven, the prince of the power of the air. There's warfare in the heavenlies. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness, against powers. Uh, there's warfare in the heavenly realm, rulers of darkness, of the air. So there is there is there's there's warfare going on, but he needs you on earth to be able to activate things in the heaven realm. So he's saying, pray that my kingdom come. Pray that you will not enter and lead it. Lord, lead me not in. Do you think God wanted to lead you in temptation? James says God cannot tempt you with evil, neither can he be tempted with evil. But everyone, when he's tempted, he's drawn away by his own lust and enticed. And when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth what? Death. Right? So God is not tempting you. Why is he asking you pray that you don't enter into temptation? Because your prayers make the difference. You don't want to be tempted? Pray. Lord, please lead me. I pray that you may lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. You have to pray that you don't enter into temptation. You are all oh man. I one thing I pray that you avoid it. Pray that you don't have to go through certain things. Don't you know your prayers can block it? Why is he telling you to pray? Don't enter temptation. Because he because if you don't pray, you're going to experience some things that could have been avoided that prayer could have avoided. I'm so grateful that I had somebody praying for me because their prayers blocked some issues that I could have had. Their prayers blocked something that was going to happen. Do you understand that prayer changes the course of the future? There's some things will happen, but because of the prayers of the righteous that avail much, they shift and alter the end result. Back to that model prayer. The universe from evil. Lead, lead me not into temptation, but the, excuse me, lead me not into temptation. <laughs> Deliver me from evil. Uh, 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 he, he's, we're praying that God will deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Giving them praise, of course. Uh, why is it in 2 Thessalonians 3 1, you know, I'm a Bible preacher. Uh, Paul says, Pray for us that the word of God may spread rapidly. 2 Thessalonians 3 1. Paul says, Pray for us. Now, the word of God may spread rapidly. Paul was on a mission journey. He's telling the church to pray for him. Now, why is Paul asking the saints to pray? Because he understands that the prayers can enhance the spreading of the gospel. Uh, why should I ask God for something that he already wants to do? My prayer will cause something in the atmosphere that releases God to do it. So unless you pray for it, it may not happen. James 4 says, you, 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 you receive not because you ask not. Y'all saints better know the word. The reason why you didn't get it is because you didn't pray for it. You mean I got to pray for everything? Yes. Some things you have to pray for because God works through you. He limits himself. You got to pray for healing. If you don't pray for healing, you won't get it. You got to pray for deliverance. You don't pray for deliverance, you won't get it. You got to pray for, for mercy. If we won't pray for mercy, we won't get mercy. You got to pray for salvation. You got to ask him to forgive you. He's not going to forgive you just because. You got to ask God, forgive me. God, please wash me with your blood. Pray, ask, pray. It's time for us to pray. There is a prayer that will make the difference in your life. Why would a sovereign God limit himself through us. That, that, that's just what he did. Um, uh, Exodus 
chapter 22. This is very important because we're in a, a engaged. We're in, in the middle of a world crisis. We're in the middle of a pandemic. People are panicking because there's a disease that spread around the globe. Uh, are, the, are some people going to die from this? Yes. Is this serious? Yes. They're about to shut down countries. Italy has had a tremendous amount of, of catastrophes and deaths. South Korea, not as many. But there are, it's happening and it can happen. And just because of what happened in Italy, it could happen worse here. It, overnight, it could just happen and people can just start dying. Okay? So let's not minimize something that we can change. I don't believe it's going to be, be worse because the saints are here. I believe that we are salt and life and salt does what? Salt preserves. And we are going to pray that God has mercy on this country, this idolatrous, perverted, rebellious country that has forsaken him. And because the saints are here and we're going to ask God for mercy, we're going to intercede and we're going to stand in the gap. Exodus, 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 please, please, please turn with me to Exodus. Uh, Ezekiel, I'm sorry, I'm getting all excited. Ezekiel chapter 22, Ezekiel chapter 22 and, and verse 26. Now this is going to bless your life. Ezekiel 22 verse uh, uh, 26 is going to bless you. I promise you, I promise you, when you see the scripture, uh, you're going to be able to contextualize where we are today. Ezekiel 26, Ezekiel 26, uh, Ezekiel 22 verse 26, Ezekiel 22 verse 26. All right, the Bible says, her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Uh, neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the, and the clean. And have hid their eyes from Sabbaths, and I am profane among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening and prey to shed blood. And to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. Check this out. And her prophets in, have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity, divining lies. See, they prophesy unto them, saying, Thus says the Lord God, when the Lord have not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and the needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Check this out. And verse 30, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation, my wrath upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith, saith the Lord God. Now, let me break the scripture down to you. Very simple. First of all, you got to know that God is love. 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 Say with me, God is love. God is love. God is love. If you want to know love, you got to know God because God is love. There's no imperfections in him. God is love, period. He's love. God is love. There's no hate in God. There's no evil in God. There's no darkness in God. There's no compromise in God. God is love. You got to know the nature of God. God is love. But also God is holy. Now, God is love and God is holy. Got to know his attributes. Attributes don't change. It's not a personality. God is love. God is holy. God is holy. God is love. God is love. God is holy. God is holy. God is love. God is love. God is holy. You got to get that down pat. God is love, but God is holy. As much as God is love, God is holy. As much as God is holy, God is love. Now, God has to protect who he is. And the reason why we compromise who we are is because we don't protect who we are. We go around other people. We don't protect what we believe. We won't protect our mind, our eyes. God protects who he is. Right? So he's love. He protects his love. He's holy. He protects his holiness. How does he do it? God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither can he tempt anybody with evil. God has to separate himself from evil. So how does he do that? He judges evil. You, you ever um, been a part of uh, um, 
a movement where the government did not do correctly. The government was supposed to uh, have justice and they didn't. And you said no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace, because justice preserves what's right. Justice is just do what is just do what is right. God's judgment protects his righteousness. So when God judges, when he seeks justice, it protects his righteousness. It protects him. So whenever there's judgment that comes upon a people, God is protecting his holiness. But just as much as God is just and protecting his holiness by uh, allowing judgment to come. And sometimes he doesn't do it himself. He allows the enemy to do what he do. The, the, all the enemy does is still kill and destroy. So he allows the enemy to do it. But understand the principle. God is love as much as he is justice, as much as he is holy. So God, oftentimes his love moves him to push back his justice. How does he do it? He needs something to stand in between his judgment justice to say please don't judge so he needs the people that he put on earth help me lord he needs you and i to say god have mercy it's almost like he don't he, he he's got to fight but he don't want to fight i gotta judge you i got but i don't want to so you know what the scripture says let me give you the background you got priests people in the church saying things are clean not clean Saying th things that ain't clean, clean. It's saying the right is wrong, wrong is right. In the last days, listen, there's going to be a great deception. People are going to believe in, believe in lies. And can't you see a lot of people believe a whole lot of crazy stuff that they didn't, never would believe 10 years ago. And we thinking it's all right now. Okay? Just lies. Great deception. In the church, out of the church, everywhere. It's deception. People are deceived. They really believe in this stuff. Read Romans chapter one. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. I said God gave them up in judgment to a reprobate mind to believe those things that they're doing is right. A bad thing if you're deceived. Thank God for the light. If you still got conviction, you better praise God. So I don't care. I'm speaking to the people that are not right today. I'm going to give you a word of wisdom. If you're not right with God, if you're not right with God, guess what? Of course, get right. But don't act like you're right. Don't lie about what you're doing. It's wrong. I've got some stuff in my life. I'm a pastor. I love God, but I'm not perfect. There's some things in my life that I still need to get right with God. I'm not going to justify it because it's me. Stop justifying your sin. Stop justifying your wrong. Or we all going to hide it. I mean, who's going to be like, hey, guess what I did? I lied. No, nobody's going nobody to do that. But you can't hide it from God. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the good and the evil. You can't hide your sin from God. But you can confess it. Don't lie to God and don't lie to yourself. If you're wrong, you're wrong. Shacking is wrong. Stealing somebody else's husband or wife is wrong. Fornication is wrong. Homosexuality is wrong. Hurting someone, lying to someone, stealing from someone. Jealous, jealousy is wrong. Unforgiveness. I know you might feel justified, but it's wrong. Don't justify. You know, I have a problem. This person really hurt me. I'm having a problem with unforgiveness. I'm not going to justify why I'm, I'm not forgiven. It's wrong. If you're wrong, you're wrong. Say you're wrong. Pray so that God can heal you from this wrong, but don't act like it's Stop justifying it. Stop justifying your wrong. If you're wrong, you're wrong. I got some wrong. I know I'm. I know, I got, watch this. I'm going, I'm going to mess you up. I got some stuff that I know is wrong in my life that I'm still working through. Sanctification is the process of becoming righteous. There's some things that I'm still giving up to God. I'm still, I'm battling it. I'm still giving, I know it ain't right, but I'm still, some of you are in the process of still giving it up to God. Some people confess Christ, but still had a problem with, with, with nicotine, still had a problem with some uh, issues. Oh, no, no. Hey, hey, listen, some folks have some physical uh, maladies and some issues that they got to give up. OK, so what's wrong? Wrong. Don't be deceived is my point. Always tell yourself the truth and be able to tell God the truth. Now, now that we have this point, they were calling right, wrong and wrong, right. Right. 
And as a result, and then they was profit lying. We have a whole lot of prophets that are profit lying. They got the answer. Nobody has the answer all the time. You know, you can be anointed and be a prophet and still not know something. Oh, I'm going to say that again. That's going to bless some of you because you think every prophet knows everything. Every pastor, I got a prophetic gift on my life. I know I got a prophetic gift. I ain't got to tell you. you. You come on Sunday morning and see. I preach prophetically. I teach prophetically. I speak prophetically. I ain't got to prophesy every, every minute of the day. And God don't always speak to some things that are not revealed to me. You know, some prophets, they, everything is revealed to them. Do you realize that Elijah, Elisha, he said, find out what's wrong with this woman. Because the Lord has not revealed it to me. Don't you understand that no prophet has the gift without measure? So sometimes God don't reveal stuff to you. Your prophet, can, your prophet, can, oh, pro, every, everybody in the, really, really prophet? You got a word for everybody? <laughs> Especially when I whip out this hundred dollar bill, you got a word for everybody. You can't have a word for everybody. Everybody, I'm and listen, I believe in prophets. I believe in the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. They're manifestations of the spirit. But we don't we don't we don't we can't see everything, is what I'm telling you. We're limited. Okay? So so when we sober up, we understand. And some of you push these men. Of, and woman of God to prophesy. They, we don't, we, we, listen, I always got a word for you. I always got a word for you. I always got a word for you. I can prophesy upon you right now. Everybody got a word for you. But I can't prophetically give you a word all the time. I, and it doesn't mean that I'm not gifted. It doesn't mean I'm not as anointed. It, it means I'm balanced. That's what I am. That's what you're going to get. Balance. Okay? Now, uh, you want to go, go ahead, go ahead and run after the people that got a word all the time. So these are the people that God was talking about. You were saying, thus said the Lord, and the Lord didn't say it. Right? Ezekiel chapter 20, 22. Read it, 26 through 31. You were saying, thus said the Lord, uh, these prophets were lying and saying God said something and he didn't say it. Right? And all this nonsense that was going on in his house, in his church, in the land. So as a result of that, God is like, listen, if I don't do anything, it's like I'm approving it. I have to judge them. I have to allow justice to take place because they're wrong. Right? Watch. So before God judges them, he's saying, okay, who can, I, who can stand in the gap so I don't have to kill these people? So I don't have to destroy the land. I'm a loving God. I don't want to hurt them. Do you realize that he searched to and fro and could not find one person to stand in the gap? He could not find one intercessor. He said, I saw for a man, someone who would stand in the gap, praying for the will of God to occur. Is there anyone praying right now, standing in the gap for America, standing in the gap for Italy, standing in the gap for North Korea, South Korea, for France, for Europe, for Africa? Who's standing in the gap? There's a prayer that will make a difference. Who's standing in the gap? Not just for your house, not just for your prosperity, not for your ministry. Are you standing in the gap so that God will stay his hand so that God will push back the hand of the enemy because it's not God's hand doing this. It's the enemy. Huh? Now, what is the gap? The Bible says that as high as the heaven is above the earth, so far as his way from, from, from our ways and his thoughts from our thoughts. What is the gap? It means what God wants, what God wills, and what really is happening. It's between what God wants, what, he's, what he wills, and what's really happening. God wants his people to repent. Right? But all they know. So he has to judge. But there's somebody that can stand in the gap and say, Lord, have mercy. Um, Jesus made a statement that helps us to understand the concept of standing in the gap. Um, he, 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 made, he makes the statement um, of intercession. He is the great intercessor. He stood in the gap between God judging us. Why? Because he was the substitute. And guess who took the fall? He did. Abraham stands in the gap. And he's trying not to allow God to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He stands in the gap and says, Lord, if there's 50 righteous, will you save them? If 30 righteous, will you save them? He, he negotiated all around, way down to 10. Will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? God is looking for somebody to stand in the gap. 
There is a prayer that makes a difference. There is a prayer that will cause God not to uh, 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 allow judgment, not to allow people to be wiped out. There's a prayer. And I'm saying that God ain't caused this. It was a, it was a devil. The Bible says this. And let, let me give you this, uh, an excerpt from this parable. The Bible says, while men slept. It was a parable that says, while men slept, uh, there was a soul that went out and he sowed wheat. And he sowed wheat in the field. But while men slept, an enemy came and he sowed tares with the wheat. When they woke up, they realized that their seed had been tampered with. God, somebody's been messing with what God did in my life. Somebody's been messing with what God did in my family. Somebody's been messing with my promise. Somebody's been messing with, I know God did this. I know God uh, 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 caused this relationship, this marriage together. I know God told me to start this ministry. I know God told me to start this business. I know God did this, but something happened between when God did it and now. The Bible says, while men slept, an enemy came in to sow tares with the wheat. And I have to admit, guys, this church has been sleeping. The church has been sleeping. The prophets that's been prophesying has been sleeping. The people that are supposed to be interceding has been sleeping. How have we been sleeping? We've been arguing uh, against one another. How have we been sleeping? We've been praying for material things. How have we been sleeping? We've been uh, concentrating on our little thing, or our little home, our little church. Uh, but there was no one really standing in the gap. While men slept, an enemy came in and sold tares with the wheat. So sometimes you got to understand that the enemy comes in. But just because he came in doesn't mean he has to stay. We have the power to pray and our prayers can make the difference. Um, uh, the principles of the Bible are in sequence. Uh, in uh, Corinthians, 2 Chronicles, excuse me, chapter 7, verse 14. And in context... Um, this is a prayer um, that God gives to Solomon and his people. And he says, listen, because I know you're going to rebel. I know you know you're going to do some stuff. But whenever you turn to this temple and whenever you do something wrong and I shut up the heavens or I, or judge, I got to judge something. He says, if my people. This is the context. This is, this is the context. The context. Whenever I have to cause judgment, whenever there's locusts in the land, there's pestilence, there's plagues, there's terrorism. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves. Huh? What is humble? Let's stop there. Because we say it so quickly. What does it mean? When you humble yourself, you put yourself in a lower state. You blame yourself. Lord, it's me. It's my fault. COVID-19 took so many people out. I could have been doing more. Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'm on lie. I'm part, of the, I'm part of the blame. I could have prayed this thing off. I personally believe it. I know you think I'm crazy, but I ain't. It's my fault. I'm the church. I should have been watching. I should have saw this thing a long time ago. Lord, forgive me. Humble myself. I humble myself and pray and seek my face. He said, and turn from their wicked ways. Oh yeah, there's some things I got to stop doing. There's some things we got to stop saying. There's some imaginations I got to stop it, there's some acts of omission. Oh, what would he do? It's not, you know, you can sin and not do something. You can sin by not doing what you're supposed to do. Sense of commission, sense of omission. There's some mothers, they didn't, they didn't punch their children or hurt their children. They didn't, they just didn't feed them. They didn't feed their babies. They just didn't do mal malnutrition. You know, you can abuse somebody by not doing what you're supposed to be doing. We can sin by not doing what we're supposed to be doing. huh? For he that knows to do good and don't is sin. That's what the Bible says. So uh, here, uh, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from the wicked ways. He says, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. This is a time, clearly, we don't have to get into a debate of why this happened. Oh, some person in the laboratory or whatever. We all want to... The bottom line is there's a plague in the land. There's a pestilence in the land. There's a plague in the land. It's going to kill some people, guys. It's going to hurt some folks. But the church has the answer. Jesus says, if the, the Lord says, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sins, and I'll heal their land. 
We have the power to change this thing. We have the power to change this. Church, I call you to prayer. I call you to prayer. Not to fear, but to prayer. Not to fear, but to humility. Come on, we gotta admit that we, we gotta humble ourselves. We walk around here and all this stuff is happening. We are the soul and life of the earth. Let's ask God for mercy. Let's ask God for forgiveness. Let's ask God, we fighting over one another, denomination, all this other nonsense. Let's ask God. The church has the answer. It's not a denomination. The church has the answer. You know, let me check this out. I watched, and I'm in New York City, and most of you know, Mayor de Blasio and our governor, Governor Cuomo, they do not get along. Although they're Democrats, they don't get along. And, and none of them, too, can stand our president, Donald Trump. They don't get along. Um, yesterday, and I have to say, all three of them are doing an outstanding job. Whether I have a personal likes for any of them uh, is, is not the question. They are doing an outstanding job. I'm watching them very closely. The governor was very sharp yesterday. Um, and de Blasio's on it and, and Donald Trump. I'm watching everybody and they, they're, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, thank God. But I've watched these people that were at odds, I watched them work together. And I was like, what are you looking at? Because yesterday, Cuomo was throwing jabs, and then, you know, uh, uh, President Trump was tweeting and drumming. But today he got up and says, yeah, you had a conversation with Cuomo, and we're working together. <laughs> I'm like, oh, really? Y'all work together? <laughs> Cuomo, I, I turned to New York One, and Cuomo was like, yeah, you know, we're working with the president, putting that inside. You know, you got Man de Blasio working with Cuomo, talking about we're going to uh, do the 48-hour lockdown. Uh, you, it's called the um, uh, stay-at-home order. Um, you know, a shelter, stay, you know, that, that whole stay. Everybody's working together. They don't like each other, but they're working together. <laughs> Why? Because it's time of crisis. Time, they have to. If they don't work together, we're in trouble. Okay? So it's not about whether I like you. And, we we got to put the stupidness aside. It's not about what denomination you are, what color you are, uh, whether you believe in this. Or believe. Listen, we believe in God. We believe in the Lord Jesus. Let's touch and agree together and believe God together. I'm Catholic, but I'm Baptist. But I'm, listen, I'm calling the people of God to prayer. Let's pray and ask God to have mercy on the land. Let's pray and ask God that the blood of Jesus will be uh, the, the penalty for our sin. He is the substitutionary lamb. He is the substitutionary lamb. Let's pray and ask God for mercy. Do you realize all of the evil that we are turning to? All of the evil in the land? Kids are getting sex changes before they're even 13. Evil in the land. Craziness. Okay? Um, we, 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 well, listen, I love everybody. But I think it's kind of crazy to... To, 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 to allow a child to, to transform their body before they're even of age. I changed my mind as an adult. Just craziness, stuff we would have never thought of ever. And, you know, people are afraid to speak about it. I, I'm not afraid to speak about it. I'm speaking as a pastor, not in anything else. Speaking as a pastor, and I just think it's crazy. In my opinion, things crazy. But these are the things we need to pray against. You know why, folks? Because this is deception in the land. They're believing lies. They're believing wrong things. I'm praying. I'm standing up for righteousness. I'm sorry. You don't like me. I'm so sorry. But I got my opinion. My opinion is this book. It's my opinion. And this is the reason why we, we need to... There's more of us. There's more of us for us than there is against us. It may look... You may think that you're the minority. You're not the minority. You're not the minority. There's more that is with us than there is against us. So why are you afraid to stand up? Why are you afraid to ask God for mercy? Say, God, this is wrong. And we ask you to forgive us for this wrong. Why are you afraid to teach your children the way the word says? Come on. You don't have to put, put nobody else down to lift him up. We don't have to ridicule anybody or hate anybody else. This is a book of love and of forgiveness. But there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, I'm coming to a close, but uh, before I come to a close, Remember, there is a prayer that makes a difference. I'm going to close with this. And I pray that you've enjoyed this. Share this. Share this while you're on. If you ain't on, please share it. I got another about five, seven minutes. Share this while you're here. Uh, there, there, I'm going to close with this. And, and the scripture is found in Matthew chapter 15. 
Matthew chapter 15. I, I want you to know that there's a prayer that will make the difference. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll turn to Matthew 20 first. I'm not going to even, even read it. Matthew chapter 20, verse 9, uh, uh, verse 29 to 34. Um, the story of a man named Blind Bartimaeus, all right? Son of Timaeus. He was a Jew, right? You know that in scripture, it's in Matthew 20, 29 through 34. He was a Jew, you know that, because he had a father. And, and, and Matthew 20, 29 through 34. Blind Bartimaeus had a father. He was a son of Timaeus. You know he was he was Jewish, Jewish law, all of that. And he was on the side begging because he was blind from birth. Jesus was passing through, you know, on his normal evangelist tour, preaching the gospel and everything. He heard that Jesus was passing by. And the Bible says that blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, started yelling and screaming, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He wasn't talking. He was yelling, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus! They were like, be quiet. We're trying to hear the master talk. Shut up, man. Here's he. And they were throwing money at him, probably. Be quiet. Shut up. Be quiet. And he's screaming, yelling, Jesus! Thou son of David, have mercy on me. He's screaming at the top of his lungs to the point where Jesus was teaching and he was screaming. The Bible says Jesus was walking and would have passed him by. He, 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 he kept walking, and he started screaming and yelling. Now, he's blind, so he can't chase him, right? But he's screaming and yelling. Then the Bible says Jesus stopped and turned around and says, bring him to me. The same people that was telling him to shut up now are saying, be a good cheer. The master hears you. I want you to understand the phoniness of people. In one instance, they'll tell you to be quiet. And one instance, they'll tell you, don't do all of that. One instance, they'll tell you, you know, you don't take all that, all that screaming, yelling, and all that praising God. But as soon as God starts to move, they want to get on in it with you. Right? <laughs> tell this guy, ho, oh, come be a good chair. So they want to they wanna photo op. So they, they, they grab him. Right? Uh, and then they, they walk they walk him to Jesus. You know, they want to photo op. And he says, and Jesus sees him. And he says, uh, okay, you've been yelling and screaming. What can I do for you? I mean, isn't that something? Now, please understand the scripture. Jesus asked this blind man that was there from birth, who was screaming and yelling his messianic name, son of David, have mercy on him. He's crying. He's asking for mercy, right? Understand the text. He's blind. Jesus is not blind. He can see. Everybody knows that the man is blind. Everybody knows that Jesus is a healer. Why did Jesus ask this man what do you want me to do for you? I'm telling you that God limits himself. You got to ask for what you need from God. If you don't ask, you ain't going to get it. The reason why you didn't get your miracle because you didn't ask. And when you ask, like James says, you ask it amidst. You ask so you can consume it on your flesh. You ask in the wrong spirit, the wrong way. You didn't have the right heart when you asked. I'm trying to get you to pray right. I'm trying to get you to get your miracle. How do you get it? You got to ask God the right way with the right heart. A blind man is standing before Jesus. And Jesus is going to ask him, what do you want? It makes no sense. Yes, it makes all sense. He limits himself. There's a prayer that makes a difference. What is prayer? Prayer is communication with God. What have you not been asking God for? See, the enemy, watch this, I got it. Some of you have been stuck in a situation for a long time. You've been stuck in, stuck in a circumstance for a long time. And you know what the enemy got you to do? He got you to stop praying. He got you to stop believing. He got you to stop asking God. So you stop asking God. You stop praying for your wife. You stop praying for your husband. You stop praying for your ministry. You stop praying for your business. You stop praying to be restored. You stop praying to be healed. You stop praying for, for that daughter, that son with mental illness. They've been like that for so long. You stop praying for the man at the well for 30, uh, at the pool for 38 years. You stop praying. The enemy got you distracted. He got you to not pray because he knows that there is a prayer that makes a difference. You, the reason why you're in the situation is because you stopped praying. I'm running over my time. I'm sorry. I'm running over my time. You stopped praying. You wanted to work? Pray. You wanted to work? Pray. Knock. Knock and keep on knocking. Pray and keep on praying. 
We want disease to stop. Let's pray. This kind comes not by prayer and fasting. So we need to be fasting. We need to be fasting during this time. We need to be fasting. Come on. I'm calling the church to fasting. Mark chapter 9. Why couldn't we cast him out? Because this kid, first of all, your unbelief. Second of all, this kind come not about prayer, prayer and fasting. We walk around eating mad because the restaurants is closing down. We upset. Oh, we can't even eat nowhere. You mad because restaurants is closing, closing down when we should be fasting. We should be fasting. We upset walking around. God convicted me. I'm walking around for lunch. Man, ain't nothing open. <laughs> I'm like, man, ain't nothing open today. Ain't nothing open. Man. Holy Ghost convicted me like, maybe you shouldn't be eating that coronavirus salad. That COVID-19 burger. Maybe you should not be eating that pizza with pepperoni and COVID-19 on top. It's time for us to fast, church, and pray. Fasting and prayer can heal a land. If my people will humble themselves and pray. Humility, fasting is a form of humility. Fasting is a form of humility. If my people were to call by my name, will humble themselves. Who's fasting? Is the church fasting? I'm calling RCM to fasting. Calling, I'm putting you on a 48-hour fast. Fast and pray. Fast and pray. Fast and pray. People are dying. Fast and pray. People are dying. Fast and pray. People are, uh, 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 it's coming down with all kinds. Fast and pray. If there's ever was a time for us to fast and pray, it's now. Let's get back to, but I have not lost my place. I know it sounds like it, but I'm right where I started. Jesus is talking to a blind man, and he asks, what do you want me to do for you? Prayer makes the difference. What do we want God to do for us? Why are we fasting? Why are we praying? God, not only do I want you to stop this COVID-19, but I want you to fix this mess in our country. Heal our land. Revive our church. Raise up men and women of God, not just celebrity personalities, but God, raise up the anointed. Raise up the no-name. I want a no-name anointing. Y'all ain't, ain't ready for me. I want a no-name anointing. You ain't got to know my name long as he knows my name. I don't need a title to be anointed. I want a no-name anointing. Everybody want to go, I don't care. He'll make, if I make his name great, he'll make... I don't care about him making my name great. Just as long as his name can be great. The name of Jesus. Fasting. I'm calling the church to prayer. Not just RCM. Everybody is watching. You know you should be fasting. Now, if you don't, if you don't even got to fast the whole day, but come on. They even say, science has even proven that intermittent fasting helps you. It helps you. Helps your blood sugar. It helps your weight. If there ever was a time... You should be fasting. It's now. We, we are waiting for the governor and the mayor to put us on a place, a shelter uh, um, order, to put us on um, a house arrest, basically. <laughs> you know, that we are to stay home for 48 hours. We're just waiting for that to happen. Instead of us being proactive, saying, Lord God, we ask you to have mercy on the land. Heal the land. God is looking for an intercessor. But because in Ezekiel 22, he didn't find any. Oh boy, the fire came down. It got worse. Saints, if we don't start praying, it's going to get worse. I don't believe it's going, I don't believe it's going to get worse because we're going to pray. Prayer changes things. But if we don't do nothing, it's going to get worse. If the church don't pray, it's going to get worse. Now, if Bishop, I, I don't want to call no names, but if the popular preachers were calling you to fast and pray, y'all be like, all right, yeah, this, this, you don't got to be popular to hear the truth. You don't have to be popular to hear the truth. Yes, I'm, I'm hitting my Bible. <laughs> fast, pray, pray fast, fast, pray, pray fast. 
Stand in the gap. Lord, have mercy. That's what God is saying right now. You want to hear a prophetic word? God is saying intercede. You want to hear a prophetic word? God is saying say I'm sorry. God is saying repent. Now ain't the time to be messing around. Listen, we all got stuff that we can do. But now's the time to get it right and kind of pray. Hello? 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 Now's the time to not be smoking and drinking. Listen, we all know whatever you are, wherever you I'm calling everybody to repentance. Come on, at least for now. Come on. Come on back home. Get yourself together right now and let's pray for God for mercy. Get back to blind Bartimaeus and I'll close. I hope you share it and so it'll bless somebody. I know this is blessing somebody. I pray this is blessing somebody. But yes, I'm going on the fast. Um, watch this. He asked blind Bartimaeus, what do you want to do for me? Now, blind Bartimaeus could have been like, are you serious, Jesus? But he said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus prays for blind Bartimaeus. And he's healed. Now, if that man didn't do something extraordinary, something to seize the moment, he would have missed the moment. You can't wait to tomorrow. You got to do it now. If that man did not yell, scream, and ask God, Jesus would have left and he would have remained blind. I promise you, blind Bartimaeus would have died blind if he didn't yell and scream and get Jesus at the time. What am I saying? There's windows of opportunity that we must do things. You got to pray now. You got to fast now. You got to repent now. You got to speak now. Now is the time. You wait till next week. People are going to die. You can save some lives by praying, by fasting. This contagion, we're looking for a vaccine. I'm praying no for the Holy Ghost. The blood of Jesus be upon the door. People want people to watch this and think I'm talking crazy stuff, but you that are spiritual know I'm talking right. So it's crazy to them because they're not spiritual. They don't understand spiritual things. We know the word. We understand spiritual things. So if we don't do it now, when are we going to do it? We got to do it now. All right. I got to come to a close. Let me... Teach you something before I leave. All right. You got to know you got to seize the moment. We know prayer changes things. We know we got to humble ourselves and pray. We know there's a prayer that makes a difference. You know, you can't just pray any kind of prayer. You got to partner your prayer with something. Partner your prayer with fasting. Partner your prayer with the faith. Partner your prayer with the word. Right. All these things we taught. Now, I'm going to give you this last one. And I promise you I'm going to close. I promise you I'm going to close. Give you this last one. In Matthew chapter 15. Verse 21 through 28, you have a Gentile woman, a Syrophoenician woman. We know this story. There's a woman that was a Gentile. Now, Jesus was there, and he went to the coast of, uh, uh, he went out, out uh, into the heathen territory and found the Syrophoenician woman. And she came after Jesus. Crying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. The same messianic thing that blind Bartimaeus said. But the only difference is she wasn't the son of somebody. She's just a, a, a Gentile. All right? And this was the time. It wasn't the dispensation where Jesus had already been crucified and died. So Gentiles were unclean. Gentiles were Gentiles. And she's saying, Lord, have mercy on me. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me because my, my daughter is vexed with the devil. Bible says Jesus did not answer her a word. She's crying. Now, please understand, I don't care who you are. If you see a woman crying and you're a man and it don't affect you, you're a human being, it don't affect you, that's a problem. But a man, a woman crying that her daughter's vexed and you ain't, you, you're you not moved, something's wrong. Something's wrong with your heart. You can't say you got love in your heart and you see a woman, poor woman crying, Then, and, but he answered her not. He didn't even answer her. He kept going. He didn't ask me more. He ignored her. Understand that she did not stop praying. Stop quitting in the middle of the process of praying. We got to pray until God sends revival. We have to pray until God heals this, this, this evil plague. We got to keep praying. Saints, the church needs to pray. 
can't just pray for 24 hours. Oh, it didn't work. Are you kidding me? Pray. She kept on. And she, he says, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'm not sent to you right now. In other words, this is not your time. It's not your time. I'm, it'll be a time for you, but now it's not now. Do you realize that you can make not your time now your time? You have the power to change what God is going to do. God is not doing, he's not healing Gentiles right now. He's doing this. He's not doing that. But you can change the, and alter what God can do in your life. You have the power to do that. This woman prays and she's crying out. She's saying, have mercy on me. Thou son of David. And you know what he, he said? I'm not sent to, to the Lord sheep of the uh, house of Israel. The disciples saying, send her away, Lord. Send her away. Because she's crying out after us. She wasn't crying out after them. We think people are coming to church for us. <laughs> ain't nobody coming for us. Ain't nobody coming for you. I know you can sing. I know you can preach. I know you can teach. But we ain't coming for you. We're coming for Jesus. Yeah. I know it, I know you may think we're coming for you. We're not coming for you, sir. We're not coming for you. I know you got a beautiful voice, but I'm, not, I'm coming to church to hear God. So he says, I'm not sent to you. You know what she did? She got on her face and started worshiping. There's something about worship that makes the difference. There, you got to partner your prayer with something. You got Your prayers alone won't work. Remember, James says, yeah, just because you pray don't mean you're going to get it. But you didn't get it because you prayed. But just because you prayed don't mean you're going to get it. Because you got to pray the right way. You got to partner your prayer with faith. You got to partner your prayer with praise and worship. You got to partner your prayer sometimes with fasting. You got Your prayer needs partner. So she had the faith, but the faith just enough wasn't working. So she mixed a little worship with the faith. Have you ever been cooking and things are coming out good and you taste it? It needs a little salt. You know what I mean? It, it, it's not right. It, needs a, mm. it tastes good, but it's missing something. Sometimes your prayers alone, sometimes you got to do something. Sometimes you got to vow a vow. Sometimes you got to sow a seed. You know what I mean? There's different things that you do with your prayer. Sometimes it's sowing a seed. Sometimes it's vowing a vow. Sometimes say, God, if you do this, I do. It, you got to mix your prayer with something. Mix your prayer with faith. Mix your prayer uh, with, with fasting. Mix your prayer with a partner. Come on, I, I need two. If two or three uh, touch it and agree, we going to do this. So you got to mix your prayers. Your prayers alone ain't good. You got to mix it. Mix it. Mix it. She's mixing her prayer with faith and worship, right? She's mixing it all up. Boy, I'm telling you, she's going, she's going, she's trying to work a miracle, right? So she's, you know, she's, this recipe is a recipe for a miracle. And she's on there and boom, she gets rejected. Check this out. She says, Lord, have mercy on me. Help me. Now she's crying at his feet. Now I'm telling you, he's a man. Jesus is a man. Looking down at a woman crying for her daughter at his feet. It'll move me. It'll move anybody. You know what he says? He says, it's not meat for me. It's not lawful for me. It's not right for me to give the children's bread and to feed it to dogs. What did you call me? Now, you know, yo, uh, you, you know, you know, in this culture, you call a woman a female dog, somebody going to fight. That was just as offensive. A little lap dog called her. It was just as offensive. It was just as offensive. He called her a dog. He didn't have to do that. He was rejecting her. This is not your time. You're a dog right now. No. I'm not, it's not even right for me to take the healing that I'm supposed to be giving to, to the children and feed it to the dogs. No. It's not your time. The little, little girl died. If that woman didn't do that, she was going to, I promise you, read the scripture in Matthew chapter 15. If she didn't do what she did, that her daughter was going to die. Her daughter would have been demon possessed all of her life and would have died. And Jesus would have been all right because he wasn't coming for that. All of you got to stick to your mission, too. You know, you know what happened to the man of God and in, in Kings. <laughs> but you know what she did? She says, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. She wanted her miracle no matter what. And the question is, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want your miracle? How bad do you want deliverance? How bad do you want healing? How bad do you want your ministry? How bad do you want marriage? How bad do you want relationship? How bad do you want the anointing? How bad do you want the gifts of the spirit? How bad do you want it? If you want it bad enough, 
you'll fight bad enough. If you want it bad enough, you'll cry hard enough. If you want it bad enough, you'll believe God until your breakthrough comes. I'm telling you that there is a prayer that makes the difference. Partner your prayers with some principle. Prayer, partner your prayer with faith. Get somebody else involved to pray with you. Jesus says, if one shall chase a thousand, two shall put 10,000 to flight. I got about 60, I got about 75, 80 people on the line watching right now. Uh, and just at, at one time, um, and you know, you go going in and out. But just if we could get two or three to agree, can you imagine we get 80, 100 people to start agreeing on one thing? Can you imagine what happened? How about a thousand? How about 10,000? You know what we can do for the world? We can use a crisis with the enemy meant for evil and work it out for God's good. Work it out for your good. So we can take a crisis like COVID-19, the coronavirus that's supposed to kill so many people, and we can come together and pray as a church and as a nation. I'm calling the church to prayer. I know the president, he called the, the National Day of Prayer, and that's nice, but the president ain't a... Listen, the pastors are, and the preachers and the prophets and the evangelists and the people of God, we're supposed to call the church to prayer because we're the church. Nothing against the president. I'm not com coming against him. You do be the president. That's what they elected you for. But I'm going to be the man of God. That's what God called me for. You, you got to be the man of God. You got to be the woman of God because that's what he called you to, right? So I challenge every pastor. I challenge every bishop. I challenge every leader to call the church to prayer. Don't wait for a prayer conference. By the time we get there, it may be too late. Don't wait for your prayer breakfast or, or whatever you got planned. Do it now. Why are we waiting? Why are you? All right, so you're going to fast in January, but in, in March, we got a problem, and you ain't going to fast now? Come on, guys. I, I, I really humbly... Now, I, I have power over, I'm a pastor, I have influence over RCM, Restoration Christian Ministries, and I'm calling Restoration Christian Ministries to prayer and to fasting. But I, I would admonish you and I would encourage you to fast and pray with me that God will heal the land. That God will not only heal the land, but he will revive the churches. That he will raise up men and women of God. And we need to pray specifically for laborers. He told us. Now, why would he ask us to pray for laborers if he couldn't descend in him himself? He needs your prayers. He chooses to work through your prayers, through my prayers. So we're going to pray. I know I was long. I hope I blessed you. I, I don't normally um, teach this long in person. Um, it's usually um, 55 minutes or so. Um, I did one hour and, and we just go. But I, I, I thought it was necessary. Okay, so I'm going to pray uh, and share this message Father, in Jesus' name, I come and I thank you and I ask you, Lord, for those that are watching, I pray for uh, forgiveness. God, forgive me for my sins, the things that I committed, my trespasses, the things that I did, the things that I said, the things that I thought. Lord, I ask you for forgiveness. I pray that you might forgive me and forgive those, Lord. We confess it. Lord, I've said some things. I've touched some things. I've tasted some things. I've thought some things. Forgive me in the name of Jesus. Wash away my sins. Purify my heart. Cleanse me, Lord, I pray. Remove from me all that is standing in the way of your love. And God, I pray, Lord God, not only do I ask you to forgive me, but I ask you to forgive those that are watching. I ask you, Lord God, to turn us back to you. God, you said if your people, we are your people. I know the text meant Israel, but we are, the Bible says that when we are Christ, we're Abraham's seed and ears according to your promise. And Lord, therefore, we are Abraham's seed. We are your people. Um, we, are, we are your people. And we ask you for forgiveness. We humbled ourselves. We know that we have uh, slept. And while we slept, the enemy has done this. The enemy has sown tares with the wheat. But we pray that although, Lord God, uh, some people died and some people got away from us and, and somehow we've grown cold and lukewarm, I pray for restoration. I pray for revival. I pray, Lord God, that the person that's watching me right now will renew and rededicate their lives to Christ. That, God, that we will not be so focused on social media or other things of the culture of the world. But, God, that we will be focused on the thing that matters most. And that's our relationship with you. I pray, Father God, for our children. I pray for our elderly. I pray for our seniors. 
I pray for the people that are home with um, uh, these these manifestations and uh, these uh, um, signs of the illness, those that are coughing and those that have fever. I pray, Lord God, for those that are already suffering from the symptoms of this virus, and not only this virus, uh, but all kinds of diseases. God, uh, in the name of Jesus, those that are suffering from any infirmity, I rebuke the infirmity now. In the name of Jesus, I believe, God, right now that you are healing them now. I bind and I rebuke the sickness and disease that's that's rappling their body uh, and, and that's touching and and destroying the organs, the blood, the, the neurological system, the brain. God, I pray for healing. I pray for healing. I pray for healing. I pray for divine healing. God, heal the land. God, heal the nation. God, have mercy upon this nation. Have mercy upon this government. Have mercy upon the church, even in this nation. God, we have forsaken our first love. And God, we ask you that you may restore us back to you. I pray that you may restore us back to our first love, where we've fallen from. I pray, God, that we will not be caught up with material things. We can't serve God and mammon. We can't serve you and money at the same time. I pray that you might have mercy upon the church. Raise up men and women of God that will fear you, that will love each other, and that will love not their lives unto the death. They defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And God, I pray that you may raise up men and women, men and women, men and women, anoint them. You promised God in your word that in the last days you will pour out your spirit upon all flesh. And young, you said your men and women uh, uh, shall be blessed. Oh God, because we will be anointed with this grace and that your young men shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And Lord God, and, and the young men shall see visions. And Lord, you said that, that and Lord, I believe that, that our sons and daughters will prophesy. I believe it, God, with all my heart that you will raise up a prophetic voice of prophetess and prophets and men and women of God. I thank you for the release, God, now. Now I pray, Lord God, that you might have mercy upon those that even deserve the judgment. The, the land deserves to be judged. Uh, the stock market deserves to crash. But God, there's a people that love you that have their money in the stock market. There's a people that love you that have an interest in the, in the earth. Thank you for your mercy. And we pray that the spread of this virus uh, will not spread. I pray, Lord God, that it will be stopped. I pray, God, that you will have mercy upon your people, that the blood of Jesus may be upon the doorposts of our homes, of our vessels, God, of our children, of our men and our women. Thank you, Lord, for what you've started. In the name of the Lord, I bless your people. And as we consecrate ourselves and we uh, sacrifice during a time of Lent, a time of fasting, a time of prayer, a time believing you for greater, I pray, God, that you may show yourself strong and show yourself mighty. In the name of the Lord, amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. I bless you, um, men and women of God. I went over my time, but I hope that you were blessed by this. Please share this. And let's spread the word that there is a prayer that makes the difference. There is a prayer that make there is a prayer that makes the difference. I hope you go over these principles that I gave you. There's a prayer that makes a difference. I'll be back on uh, again um, on Sunday morning. May the Lord bless you real good. It's so good to to see each of you on today. Uh, and um, I want you to encourage other people uh, to to get them in the fight with us. Hey, you know I'm going to be praying. You know, you, you guys that, that are working together, pray. I don't know we work out. Let, you know, give five minutes, ten minutes to pray about the situation. You know, you, you somebody on your job, just get them and pray. We should be praying, saints, every day. This is time to pray. It's time to pray. I'm calling the saints to prayer. All right, may the Lord bless you real good. And, you know, some of us are not even going to church. Pray. I'm excited. I'm excited about what God is going to do. God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in. And may you continue to keep me in prayer. Uh, and, and you can also, being that this is our Bible study hour, RCM's Bible study hour, it's not just my personal um, time. Um, you can cash app uh, the, the church, um, Dallas on um, RCM Restores, uh, Dallas on RCM Restores, and be a blessing to the church. Uh, this is not my personal time. This is for the church. This is during our Bible study hour. So I would ask you to um, be a blessing. You can um, uh, Dallas sign. Um, RCM Restores, RCM Restores, uh, and you can be a blessing there. You can also be a blessing um, through uh, Givelify, and I believe uh, someone can put on there the text to give that we have. May the Lord God bless you real good. God bless you. Have a great night.